All right, this is part three of the lecture on, it's actually chapter 18 in our current textbook on proteins. So we covered uh, amino acids and uh, that was the first video. And then we talked, uh, well here, amino acids, amino acid based behavior was number one. Number two, we talked about peptides. And number three, we'll talk about proteins and hydrolysis. Again, enzymes is not covered in this chapter. Enzymes will be in the next unit. So protein structure. Protein structure is broken down into four main types, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. This is quite a bit different than the primary, secondary, tertiary alcohols or primary, secondary, tertiary amines that we had talked about. The level of complexity increases for each one of these. So the very first one, primary structure, is really nothing more than the amino acid sequence. And it's uh, given always amino terminus. Remember we had to, with uh, peptides we had talked about. So amino terminus to C terminus. Or sometimes the carboxy. So here we have a gly a glycine, isoleucine, valine, glutamate, glutamine. So the thing to recognize here is that the primary structure of proteins is held together by peptide bonds, or if you wish, amide bonds. And there, these bonds are formed by atoms of the alpha carbon backbone. So that when we talk about the backbone, we're referring to the alpha carbon backbone. And again, there's these, these bonds are, are uh, quite strong relative to the other interactions that we'll be talking about later. So when we talk about uh, strong peptide bonds, what that means is in order to break these, so we'd say hydrolyze or break these peptide bonds. Basically what you have to do is boil them, so I'll say 100 degrees Celsius in concentrated hydrochloric acid. So pretty harsh conditions to break these peptide bonds. Of course when you do that, when you break individual peptide bonds, right, you release individual amino acids. Okay. It says here insulin, this is a peptide hormone, We'll talk more about insulin and its role in blood sugar regulation later, but um, but uh, anyway, it's actually um, it's broken down here into two peptide chains. This is the alpha A chain or the B chain, so the alpha chain or the beta chain. So sometimes they'll use alpha chain, beta chain. These originally were together, and, the, the, and what I mean by that is they originally synthesized as one long polypeptide and then the peptide bond here was broken between uh, the alpha chain, the, the end of the alpha chain and the beginning of the beta chain. So the insulin that's flowing through your blood is actually made up of two discrete individual polypeptide chains. All right, one with 21 amino acids and the other with 30. Okay. So we are, again, we refer to these as peptides because they're not quite big enough yet to be called proteins. But, but it's a good illustration of the primary sequence or the, the primary structure. You'll also notice here these disulfides, right? the number of disulfides. These are disulfide bonds. Of course, disulfide bonds, as I mentioned before, are always between a cysteine side chain and another cysteine side chain. So what holds these two chains together are actually these disulfide bonds between the cysteine of one polypeptide chain and the cysteine of another polypeptide chain. All right, the second type of structure that we'll talk about is secondary structure. Right? So two with a degree symbol is secondary. Secondary structures few things you know these are also held together by interactions between alpha carbon backbone atoms 
So similar to the primary structure, right? also uh, primary structure one amino acid is held uh, or bonded to another by peptide bonds formed between alpha carbon backbone atoms. However, secondary structures are held together by hydrogen bonds. So we'll see this in just a little bit. So hydrogen bonds, of course, compared to peptide bonds, are much weaker. Now remember, you could break peptide bonds, but you have to boil them in acid. Here, hydrogen bonds can be just, uh, disrupted by heat or physical agitation. And we'll, what we mean by heat is, uh, remember water, let's put water here to remind us what a hydrogen bond is. Partial positive charge on the hydrogen, another water molecule comes along partial negative charge on the oxygen, and it's this through space intermolecular interaction between two separate water molecules. Now in order to break that, you don't actually have to boil it, but you just have to heat it and it evaporates. So we go from water that's a liquid to water in the gaseous phase, and in order to evaporate or vaporize liquid water, all you have to do is break this bond, and it doesn't you don't have to boil it. It doesn't take a lot of heat. So most proteins have a optimal set of conditions and for for us being humans they are at 37 degrees Celsius normal body temperature. So if you get a fever God forbid you get coronavirus and you run a high fever so this is what 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not going to do the math but if say you're running a fever and you get to like 103 degrees, a pretty high fever. This, with regard to in the laboratory, this is not a large temperature change, only five degrees Celsius, uh, five degrees Fahrenheit. But for your body, it is quite a big change. And what happens is you start breaking apart proteins because this the secondary structure held together by these hydrogen bonds starts to get disrupted, even at uh, a modest temperature increase of just five degrees. Now secondary structures, right, they're held together by hydrogen bonds between backbone atoms. We'll see the details of that in a moment, but they come in a number of different forms. The, the first one we'll talk about is something called an alpha helix. Uh, alpha just refers to this is like the first secondary structure that was identified. It doesn't have anything to do with you know, looking like an alpha or anything like that. And likewise, a beta sheet, this was the second one. So in cartoon form, we show alpha helices as coils and beta sheets as ribbons. So we'll call it like a ribbon and coil diagram. You'll see more of that later. You also will also show you again in detail how this works. But the reason it's an alpha helix is if you follow the alpha carbon backbone, this is essentially the the alpha carbon the alpha carbon backbone forms this kind of coil shape. And likewise for the beta sheet, whoops, the beta sheet. Right? Again, we have the alpha carbon backbone. There are other secondary structures as well. They talk about, uh, I don't know, some random region, but there's there's things called omega loops. So that's a Greek letter omega, kind of a sloppy omega there, but omega loops. Also something called a 310 helix. And we won't get into all these other types of secondary structures, just the two main types, alpha helix, beta sheet. So. Here we have that ribbon I was showing you, diagram I was showing you, and I'm just going to draw in red here, right, the alpha carbon backbone. And it just kind of wraps around like that. Remember when I talked about peptides and I said how the R groups, the side chains, kind of alternate? Well, you see that here, these side chains stick out of the alpha helix. So if you think of the alpha helix, sometimes you actually see alpha helix not as a coil like this, but like as a tube in some diagrams. And you'll see the R groups sticking out. Maybe I can't do one in the back, so I'll just do it like kind of like this. But they just kind of stick out of the barrel 
of this alpha helix. Now, in the next diagram, they actually show the hydrogen bonds, right? So these are hydrogen bonds. What we have here is the uh, blue is a nitrogen. Nitrogen is a more electronegative. It's bonded to a hydrogen. And then here we have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. Oxygen is partially negative. This hydrogen, I forgot to put that in, is partially positive. So partial negative, partial positive. Those guys attract each other, just like the, you know, the hydrogen bonds in water. What you'll notice here is, well, they don't, do they have the side chains? All right, this would be the alpha. You might be able to see this better here. Yeah, you can kind of see it here a little bit better. Let's call this R1, R2, R3, R4, so the R5. So the first amino acid, R1, here's its alpha carbon, here's its carbonyl. Coming towards us now is the nitrogen of the next amino acid. This is bonded to the car alpha carbon of the second uh, residue, second amino acid. Its alpha carbon has a side chain, R2. So just following this along, this is alpha carbon, carbonyl. We get to a nitrogen, so this is now nitrogen 3. Alpha carbon three, side chain three, right? Carbonyl three. After the carbonyl comes a nitrogen, right? Then the next amino acid. So this is nitrogen four. This is side chain four. Nitrogen four, alpha carbon four, side chain four. After alpha carbon four, we get the carbonyl of four. You see the carbonyl here, and then this is the nitrogen of amino acid 5. This is al alpha carbon 1. This is the carbonyl of that first one. And so we have a hydrogen bond between the NH of 1 and the carbonyl of the fifth one. So it's four, four amino acids up. So you can kind of think of it like a spiral staircase. If you're standing on one step, you can reach up over your head and touch this this step four steps ahead of you right and that reaching up is this hydrogen bond so that was alpha helix both alpha helix and beta sheet I have to put here alpha helix as well remember the key thing about both of these is uh, it's they're held together by hydrogen bonding which is much weaker bonding between backbone atoms and it's I'll put here amino acid 1 carbonyl amino acid 5 it's nitrogen and the hydrogen bond put this in blue the hydrogen bond is between those two residues for beta sheet, looks quite a bit different, a little bit easier to pick out. So here we have an alpha carbon, right? carbonyl. So that's one amino acid. They don't show the basic, the, down, down here would be the nitrogen then, NH. Here's the nitrogen of the next amino acid. And so I'll, I'll just alternate again. Here's um, next amino acid from um, the ammonia alpha carbon carbonyl. So we'll call this R2. Here we have the ammonia alpha carbon side chain. This would be R3 carbonyl. So here's the next amino acid and so forth. You can just kind of walk through here. What you'll notice, two things about this. Again, just like with the alpha helix, the side chains kind of stuck out of that barrel. Here, the side chains also stick out of the beta sheet. The alpha, the alpha carbon backbone, these atoms here form this kind of ribbon. And sometimes they'll refer to it as a beta sheet or a beta pleated sheet because it has these pleats in it. If you imagine, uh, like uh, if you have curtains at home, 
where they have they have pleats and when you draw the curtains closed they kind of fold up on themselves that's kind of what's happening here so they kind of has this up and down kind of fashion these pleats in it so sometimes you'll also hear it referred to as a beta pleated sheet in any event the side chains stick out above and below above and below above and below and so they are not involved in holding the different strands of these beta sheets together Again, it's the backbone. So we have a nitrogen, hydrogen, partial positive on the hydrogen. Here's a carbonyl, right? Partial negative on the oxygen. Now there is no, unlike with the alpha helix, where amino acid one hydrogen bonded to amino acid five, there is nothing like that with beta sheets. Because sometimes you can have, if this is amino terminus, so it's amino terminus to C terminus, so uh, amino. I'll go here, amino terminus to C terminus. You could, so here is uh, an alpha carbon, be another carbonyl. You could just simply wrap around again, and this is recall, uh, referred to as a reverse turn. So this is going from amino terminus to C terminus. This is like, you haven't really changed the order. This is also going from uh, amino terminus to C terminus. You just take this reverse turn. This is referred to as parallel. So the arrows you might have noticed right, on those uh, ribbons, you have an amino terminus to C terminus. If it wraps around like this, again, you have amino terminus to C terminus. These two arrows are going in opposite directions. This is called an anti-parallel beta pleated sheet. But you might not just have a reverse turn. You might have, I don't know, some kind of weird meander, maybe some alpha helix, and then it comes back around this way. So remember, this was amino terminus to C terminus. This is also now going to be amino terminus to C terminus. So when the two strands are going in the same direction, N to C, N to C, it's referred to as parallel. So we have parallel and anti-parallel beta sheet. And all that refers to is whether the, when you're looking at the, essentially the primary structure, is a primary structure as you're reading through it, is it going amino terminus to C terminus? And then this one, you have hydrogen bonds between these two strands. Is it also amino terminus to C terminus? I'm not gonna ask you to look at uh, something, a uh, protein structure like this, and based upon this ball and stick model, determine if it's parallel or anti-parallel. But if you see a ribbon diagram for anti-parallel, they go in different directions, amino terminus to C terminus. Parallel, they go in the same direction amino terminus to C terminus. So just in a cartoon model with these ribbons is all you have. And we'll look at some protein structures where you can see that clearly. So here we have, uh, we're now we're talking about the tertiary structure. Tertiary structure is okay, the third level of protein structure. So remember primary structure is just the amino acid sequence. Secondary structure, we had two types. There's the alpha helix and the beta sheet or the beta pleated sheet. The secondary, both primary and secondary structures are held together by backbone atoms. Once you get to the tertiary structure, now you're talking about interactions between side chains. So I'll put here side chain interactions. So the basis for this structure is quite a bit different. But the other thing that I want you to recognize is in order to get to tertiary structures, you need two or more secondary structures. So this requires two or more secondary structures. Okay. So if you look at uh, Spider silk, for example. 
you have these beta sheets and you can actually see the arrows on here so one's going uh, N to C in this direction and then there's a reverse turn going from N to C so the arrows are in opposite direction is that parallel or anti-parallel? Well, it's anti-parallel, they're going opposite directions okay, another reverse turn anti-parallel, another reverse turn, anti-parallel and so all of these are, it's a, it's a layer of anti-parallel beta pleated sheets but in addition to that, you have an alpha helix now that lies across that beta pleated sheet. Remember the side chains for the alpha helix were sticking out of the alpha helix? Likewise for the beta pleated sheet, they were sticking up and down. And so it's the side chains that, uh, atoms of the side chains that form the interactions that hold tertiary structures together. And what you're, again, what you're looking at there are at least uh, two or more secondary structures that are held together by side chain interaction. You'll see a number of different ways of looking at proteins. Uh, there's a ball and stick model and this is useful for small atom or, or small molecules or if you're kind of zeroing in on a particular interaction. Sometimes it's nice to look at a space filling model so you're kind of looking at more of the surface of the protein and seeing where uh, other proteins might interact with it. But to really see the structure Again, you need these ribbon, ribbon diagrams, these cartoons. So we have an alpha helix going this way, and there's an alpha helix like this. And so this bit of alpha helix might be interacting here between side chains. Okay, um, And this little stretch of helix here might be interacting with the strand of beta sheet. So in order to see the tertiary structure, these models aren't going to help you at all. What you really need is either a ribbon diagram or uh, and maybe I can show you this later. Just if you just see if you just see the the alpha carbon backbone, because that's essentially what we're look, following here is just the alpha carbon backbone. We strip out all the other atoms and just looking at the the contours of this alpha carbon backbone, and that's the secondary structures. Tertiary structures, you need at least a couple of these that are interacting again, held together by these side chain interactions. In more detail here, these side chain interactions, again it's a combination of, I'll say, let me use right here, two or more secondary structures and those interactions include hydrogen bonds, something called hydrophobic interactions, salt bridges, dipole-dipole interactions, and disulfide bonds. Remember primary those were the peptide bonds because we were just looking at one amino acid held to another. For secondary, it was just the hydrogen bonding between backbone atoms. For tertiary structures, because remember we have all those different side chains, 20 different side chains in those amino acids, there's a number of different types of interactions we can have there. So the first one we'll look at are these disulfide bonds. And remember, disulfide bonds only exist when you have cysteine. So you have cysteine is the only amino acid with a thiol. Okay. And if these come in close enough proximity, they can be oxidized. Oxidation is a loss of hydrogen. That's why we call it an oxidation. So right, we're losing one, two hydrogens. So loss of hydrogen is an oxidation so this is the oxidized form of a disulfide this is the reduced so this is reduced we have the thiols with the hydrogens reduction by the way right reduction is gain of hydrogen right that's reduction if we went the other way so here there and you saw this with um, insulin you saw uh, disulfide bond forming within the same chain, but you also see it forming between the two different chains. We had the alpha and, and beta chain or the A and B chain of insulin and they're held together by these disulfides. Now this is something that you see a lot in extracellular proteins or uh, like in the case of insulin, extracellular peptide. What we mean by extracellular is these, uh, these peptides, these proteins exist outside of the cell. Okay. 
So we, you know, insulin, obviously, it's uh, made in the pancreas. It's secreted into the bloodstream, and it is not inside a cell. So it's circulating, and that's not a very friendly environment for, for proteins. Uh, getting squished through the valves of the heart and through capillaries and things like that. So it can be a kind of st uh, strenuous environment for proteins. And so they need to be uh, buttressed a little bit. And that's what these disulfides do. So these are very common in extracellular proteins that give them extra strength. Of course, for structural proteins, you also see this. Okay, So they give you extra strength and stability for structural proteins. Again, structural proteins might be the elastin in your skin, or keratin, on uh, cartilage, and collagen in your hair. So these structural proteins have a, often have a lot of thiols. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So as I mentioned, keratin, insulin, uh, keratin is a structural protein. Insulin is a peptide hormone, also extracellular. IgG or antibodies. So it stands for IgG stands for immunoglobin G. There's a number of different types of immunoglobins. I'm not sure why they're given letter abbreviations, but IgG is what one typically thinks of as antibodies that are circulating in your bloodstream. We'll look at the structure of IgGs in a little bit, but right now what I want you to look at is here. So here we have a hair follicle and a hair fiber, and hair fibers are actually bundles of bundles. All right? So there's something called a collagen triple helix and you see that here right? you see this here you have one polypeptide this red one and then a green polypeptide and a yellow polypeptide these guys combine together to form a collagen what we call a triple helix now the triple helix is not the secondary structure that was the alpha helix the triple helix is where we have three of these individual polypeptide chains wrapping around each other so if you've ever looked at how rope is made for example it's a bunch of little fibers that are kind of braided together and that's essentially what your hair is and then these are held together by disulfide so um, you know you have one strand here and another and you've got all these disulfides holding them together this is also why if you've ever um, I don't know, here we can do this. If you ever burn hair, so I'll put a, like a, that's a candle with a flame on here, and there's a flame, and you burn hair, it produces, because of all the cysteines here and all the sulfur, it produces hydrogen sulfide gas, and that's that stench of, uh, you know, burning hair or burning skin or whatnot. So obviously if you burn hair, you produce it hydrogen sulfide gas, but you might also be familiar with the odor associated with getting uh, a, a perm or a permanent, right? So what uh, the hairstylist will do is we'll actually add, add a, a reducing agent to break these disulfide bonds, right? So they add that to your hair and then they put it up in curlers and it's broken these disulfide bonds. The, the hair is then coiled around those curlers or whatever and then they're reduced and when once they're reduced those these new disulfides are made so these are the the old ones say oh let's say this is in the straight hair and then once it's reduced around the curlers they're more or less fixed and you get uh, the the curly hair the, the new hairdo and you'll also, maybe if you've ever had this done, you notice you, know, you might notice that this reducing agent, this first stuff that they put on, kind of uh, smells bad. It stinks. These reducing agents break these disulfide bonds, and so they're usually thiol products as well. So I'll put here a thiol reagent. And one of the things I said about thiols, uh, skunks use thiol as their, their weapon of choice. So these thiols stink. Right, sulfur chemistry, it's kind of stinky chemistry. So the reagents that they use for giving you a perm also usually have kind of an unpleasant odor. Here, right. a lot of proteins, and insulin is one of them, a lot of proteins, now, so you see that this is the, um, they don't have the alpha and beta chains I, um, isolated here, color coded, but a lot of proteins exist in what they call a quaternary structure. 
Okay, so hexamer, hex means six. What that means is we have six subunits. So we have six alpha and beta chains. So alpha and beta would be one subunit, and there's six of them together forming this hexamer. It's kind of difficult to see here, but uh, this must be the maybe it's a, a it's probably a tyrosine um, residue. Tyrosine, remember, it was a phenylalanine with an alcohol on it, and then there's some cation here that they that they bind to. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six different tyrosines. Each one of these is what we say chelating or binding to this. Uh, this metal. I'm not sure exactly what the metal is. Um, let's just let's just call it magnesium. I'm not sure. And so basically, you have tyrosine of one bonding to it, a tyrosine of another one bonding to it. You have one here, one here, one here, one here. So you have six different amino acids, and I'm just writing in tyrosine. I'm not sure if that's what it is, but uh, the side chains, what we say chelating or bonding to that metal cation holding it together. There's obviously going to be some interaction between these individual subunits as well, and that's where we get into this what we call quaternary structure. So this is quaternary. Okay, you also see a quaternary structure. This is an antibody. This is, does it say here? This is IgG, IgG, or an antibody. There's what we call a heavy chain in blue, and a light chain in pink. Oh, here, light and heavy. Um, so, C, uh, the L here stands for light. The H stands for heavy. The V stands for variable. S the C stands for constant. So here's variable and this is constant so that doesn't change the reason one of the reasons I bring this up is not only to show you how disulfide bonds are used to link individual polypeptides together right? so this would be uh, part of the quaternary structure the side chain cysteines forming disulfides here to hold one polypeptide chain to the other, but also to give you some idea of uh, with uh, COVID-19 going on, people talk about antibodies. What are they actually talking about? They're talking about proteins that look something like this, have this kind of Y shape. So the constant regions here, they don't change. They're this, the same, you know, for, for every antibody in your body. It's these variable regions. This is it says here antigen binding site. These are the variable regions, and if you're infected with something, that uh, there are, I won't get into the details here, but often it gets, say, the viral particle gets chopped up into little bits. So this, they, what they call an antigen here, might be part of a viral or a bacterial protein. So it gets chopped up. You've got all sorts of antibodies, and some of them might have a region in you know or a structure in this variable region that just so happens to bond to this antigen so you don't have any immunity to start with because you only have a few of these molecules that bind to this part of the viral protein but once it binds it it really it begins a cascade of all sorts of other events which essentially induces the production of more of these molecules that have the same variable region so now you have a bunch of antibodies that can bind to this, and that's essentially how immunity works. So the next time your body is faced with this antigen, it already has that memory. It has a bunch of these guys that can bind to it. So here's, uh, before we saw it in, in a really a, a schematic, and now we see the IgG in, uh, again, a cartoon form, but you're seeing the ribbons here of the beta sheets. I don't really see, here's a little bit of, so it might be a bit of a coil of an alpha helix here. So this is where we get this that uh, that uh, kind of Y-shaped. Putting it all together here, and what I mean by that is talking about the primary, secondary, tertiary structure, and we'll kind of put quaternary 
later. So the primary structure, remember, that's just one amino acid bonded through a peptide bond to a second amino acid. That's amino acid two bonded through a peptide bond to a third amino acid. That's all the primary structure is. Secondary structure, right? these again is what we're looking at here, hydrogen bonds between maybe two different uh, strands of uh, beta sheet. So we have a beta sheet here. Okay, that's secondary structure. The secondary structure is again between backbone atoms. So right here, backbone atoms. I should say hydrogen bonds. Well, it says they're hydrogen bonds, but hydrogen bonds between backbone atoms to form the secondary structure. We also have this alpha helix here. Again, a secondary structure held together by hydrogen bonds through backbone atoms. Tertiary structures are where we have two or more secondary structures held together, and there are a bunch of different interactions that hold them together. So we have hydrogen bonds. They could actually be between, these are backbone atoms. right? We could have what they're referred to here as London dispersion forces, but this is isoleucine, and this side chain is valine. Okay, here we have a phenylalanine, and another this is isoleucine again. So these are hydrophobic interactions. Hydrophobic. Hydrophobic. So they're calling them London dispersion forces. Well, you might remember for London dispersion forces are also there's a there there is a difference, but we're going to call them the same thing. Van der Waal forces, or abbreviated Van der Waal forces. Hydrophobic London dispersion forces, Van der Waal forces. These are the same things. If you remember when we talked about lipids, right? You have maybe a saturated fatty acid and another saturated fatty acid. And if they lined up nice like this, we could have hydrogen bonds between them. So it's all coming back together. These are hydrogen bonds, not, I'm sorry, not hydrogen bonds, Van der Waal interactions, right? Or the hydrophobic interactions, hydrophobic or Van der Waal interactions between two fatty acid Molecules. Well, that's what you're seeing here. Okay, that's what you're seeing here is these hydrophobic interactions. And we, again, we we had a, a fatty acid micelle or soap glob with the polar head groups on the outside and all the hydrophobic tails on the inside, forming those hydrophobic interactions. Okay, again, that's what we have here. These so just as these hydrophobic interactions. Let me write that down. So if this is, again, a fatty acid micelle, this thing, what we have in the inside, again, are hydrophobic interactions. And just as the hydrophobic interactions are in the interior of this micelle, the London dispersion forces, the Van der Waal forces, these hydrophobic interactions are on the interior of proteins. So proteins kind of fold up into like this crumpled, if you imagine, I don't know, if you imagine a, a string of pearls, let's make a string of pearls like this, that would be the you know, the, uh, the amino acid sequence or protein kind of all unraveled. But what they end up doing is, as you saw in those diagrams, they all kind of curl up in this crumpled ball. And in the interior here, that's where you find these Van der Waal interactions. So these, I just say prevalent, prevalent, on the inside or interior of proteins. So they're not exposed to water. The water is on the outside. And yeah, so let's just put a maybe alcohol side chain of like a serine or a threonine interacting with water on the outside, right? So the polar groups tend to be on the outside, the hydrophobic groups on the inside. Uh, we have hydrogen bonding again between Backbone atoms, so this is between backbone, 
So this is all tertiary structures now. Higher in bonding, now these are between a side chain and a backbone. And when again, this is a carbonyl of the backbone, we'd have a, and after the carbonyl we'd have a, uh, let me put this in red so you can see it, uh, we'd have a nitrogen, after this carbon we have the alpha carbon, maybe there's a side chain coming out, I just make it alanine. Okay, so the carbonyl of one amino acid bonding, hydrogen bonding to a side chain of another, or we could have two side chains, right? an alcohol, so this is uh, what, this is uh, threonine and this is serine, so two side chains. The main thing is hydrogen bonds, right? Disulfides we talked about between cysteines, always between cysteine, the only amino acid with thiol groups. And then the, the unique one here, they refer to this as electrostatic interactions. This is also sometimes referred to as a salt bridge. What is a salt bridge? Well, we have an acidic side chain Right, with aspartic acid or glutamic acid, and a basic side chain of, I don't know, lysine or arginine. Well, what do acid and base do? They neutralize one another, right? So they form a salt. You get the ammonium, so a plus charge, and the carboxylate, the minus charge, and this is an ionic bond. Right? That's referred to as electrostatic interaction or a salt bridge between the basic side chain of one amino acid and the acidic side chain of, a, of another. I should also mention here, before I forget, tertiary structures, these are all tertiary structures, right? Well, except for the hydrogen bonds in the beta sheet, right? This is beta sheet, this was secondary structure. Alpha helix, also secondary structure. The rest of these are all tertiary structures. Tertiary structures and quaternary structures are held together by these all these other different interactions. So I just say held together by the same variety of interactions. The same variety meaning hydrogen bonds between backbone atoms, between side chains and backbones, between two different side chains, uh, salt bridges, hydrophobic or um, van der Waal interactions, and disulfide. The quaternary structure, I'll have to put this back in earlier. The quaternary structure, as I mentioned, it's um, held uh, together by the same interactions as a tertiary structure. So the same interactions as a tertiary structure. The only real difference is that a quaternary structure has two or more separate individual polypeptide chains. So an example of this was the, uh, the light chain and the heavy chain of the IgGs. Right? We had actually four different side chains. Uh, it, uh, the alpha chain and the beta chain of insulin, right? Two different polypeptide chains. Well, then it's said to have, when there are two or more separate polypeptide chains, each with their own, of course, their polypeptides, they each have their own primary, oh, I'm sorry, it's each with its own primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. Those then interact to form a quaternary structure. Another good example of this is hemoglobin. I think we'll see that in just a moment. Example, hemoglobin. So again, primary structure, just the amino acid sequence held together by peptide bonds. Secondary structure, beta sheet, alpha helix, hydrogen, held together by hydrogen bonds. Uh, again, backbone atoms. Uh, tertiary structure, Right, tertiary structure. These are side chain interactions. We had a variety of side chain interactions. Side chain interactions. And then quaternary structure, also side chain interactions.
show what they're showing here is uh, one subunit and then we have four of them put together so this would be called a tetramer tetra for four, four so four subunits held together by these side chain interactions what do proteins really look like well I showed you some models how do we know that they look like this well there's a video that I also put on Blackboard or a link to a video I put on Blackboard that gives you some indication of how this can be done. Now when I was doing my postdoc many many years ago this is how it was done. You would grow these protein crystals. I won't get into how that's done but these are very small. Uh, this might be uh, maybe uh, 0.2 millimeters in diameter. So this are usually viewed under a dissecting microscope so like 0 0.2 millimeters right so remember a centimeter is about like this call that one centimeter a millimeter is a tenth of that so that's one millimeter I'm talking about a fraction of a millimeter wide and so this might be maybe five uh, millimeters long or 0.5 centimeters long but it's very narrow in this direction so that's the scale that we're talking about generally. So we grow these protein crystals. And the details for that are not important. And then we shoot x-rays through them. So these are the same kind of x-rays that you have, say if you break a limb or something like that. Uh, same sort of x-rays except they're, um, they're in a much tighter beam aimed at that crystal. You might recognize this x-ray diffraction as the double helix of DNA. So I just call it the DNA double helix. You might be familiar with uh, Watson and Crick, two Englishmen, Watson and Crick, who figured out, deduced the structure of DNA based on this x-ray diffraction pattern. So what happens is you shoot, you have your crystal here, so your crystal, you shoot x-rays through it, and then you have a detector here and that detector there's fancier detectors now but but this is based on film so you it should be like an x-ray film okay and based upon the location and the intensity of the spots that come through okay you can deduce and again it's very complicated I won't get into x-ray diffraction here but you can deduce what the, the structure is by the way, uh, Watson and Crick didn't take the x-ray structure of DNA. Um, a woman by the name of Rosalind Franklin, Rosalind Franklin actually was working on this and she did the experiment to get the data and for whatever reason she shared it with these two guys. Uh, they figured out this structure and scooped her and didn't give her any credit. So. Uh, lesson learned, Rosalind. Don't share your data with uh, guys unless they agree in writing to uh, put you on the paper and uh, share the Nobel Prize with. Here's a structure. Here's an X-ray diffraction of a protein. You can see that the the pattern is uh, quite a bit more complicated because proteins are a lot more complicated than DNA. After getting the diffraction pattern, one can either calculate or nowadays. Uh, we don't calculate, we have computer programs that will do that for it. It will calculate a three-dimensional electron density map. So what's happening is the electrons as they pass through the crystal, they get bent or diffracted. And what they're actually getting diffracted by are the little spaces or holes between the atoms. And it's actually the uh, electron clouds around the atoms that's doing the diffracting. And so we can tell from that so kind of like a shadow if you wish we can tell where the atoms must be and then knowing the protein sequence we try to build in what the uh, alpha carbon backbone and the side chains how they will fit into this electron density map so that's how we get the structure of these and continue this lecture on a separate video where we'll talk more about protein denaturation and so a few more vocabulary terms.